This is uh, an official meeting of the Joint Committee on Elder Affairs. This is- I hear gavel. Oh, forgot the gavel. <laughs> All right, pen, yeah. okay. Um, so um, we are, so this is our first ever Zoom public hearing of the Joint Committee on Elder Affairs. Uh, it is our goal to conduct this as much as possible, like, you know, uh, as we would with any um, public hearing. Um, we are gathered to today as a Joint Committee on Elder Affairs to he hear one piece of legislation, House 4635, an act relative to long-term care facility and elder housing COVID-19 reporting. So Dimitri from my staff is going to be the host in the sense of he's pushing the buttons. So I think you're working your way through wrecking, unmuting all the committee members. Um, why don't I just start? I just want to say something briefly and then introduce all the committee members. Uh, I would just say that being a joint committee on elder affairs during the COVID-19 crisis is, uh, in the traditional meaning of the word, an awesome responsibility uh, because this virus, which is a terrible threat to all people, is particularly vicious towards uh, aging adults and especially those with underlying health conditions. And so those are the folks that this committee focuses on and cares about. So, um, you know, these are hard times and we're all trying to do the best we can uh, to support uh, those folks. So let me take this moment to introduce the members of the committee as we always do uh, during a hearing. I want to uh, recognize um, my Senate co-chair, Senator Patricia Jalen, and ask her if she'd like to make any introductory remarks before we get going. Well, I just want to commend you, Rep. Balser, for, for filing this bill. I think there's so many needs that we have right now from PPEs to staff to money, um, but information, I think, is one of the most important things and one that's really been lacking for people. And uh, I have been calling all the nursing facilities and uh, assisted livings in my district. And it's been, there's very different experiences. Um, one of my nursing homes has lost 17 people uh, and one staff 17 residents and one staff member. It's it's really terrible. Uh, but family members are, are having a hard time finding out um, despite many individual facilities efforts. So I think what you're doing is really important and I hope we will exact this bill in a timely manner. Thank you. Let's recognize, uh, I see the House Vice Chair, Tricia Farley Bouvier is here. Would you like to wave, say hello, so people can see? Hi, you. so this is Tricia. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, Madam Chair, for hosting this. Um, I greet you from the Berkshires, and um, I've decided to try to inspire you all to visit us sometime in the post-COVID era. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, this is an incredibly important um, discussion. We do have an awesome responsibility on this committee and um, it, is, it is my hope that we continue to partnership, um, partner with the administration, our advocates, our providers, so that we can do our very best work um, in this critical time. So thank you, Madam Chair. And I see the Senate Vice Chair, Becca Rausch is here. You wanna, let's, uh oh, uh, Dimitri, could you unmute? Oh. Senator Rausch. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, Madam Chair, for hosting this hearing. Um, I am going to keep myself muted for the most part. I, I can do it over here. Um, I think, Dimitri, if you don't mute me again on your side, um, because I have a house full of people <laughs> all functioning. Um, but uh, this is really important. I think all of us across the Commonwealth, all of our districts are really struggling um, with making sure that our elders are safe and cared for and have access to the care and supports that they need right now. Um, so I'm, I'm glad that we have gotten our legislative work into this realm of digital um, functionality. And I appreciate the work of, of the chairs and their staffs to make this happen. Um, 
I am a little bit jealous of <laughs> Rem Farley Bouvier's background picture, <laughs> having spent much time in the Western part of the state myself. Um, my dining room is not nearly that exciting, um, but thank you for hosting and for being here. I'm looking forward to hearing all the testimony today. And uh, Representative Gentile, would you like to say a quick hello? Hello, and uh, good to be with you all. Uh, rem well, remind uh, the people who've joined us for the hearing uh, your district. I should have mentioned that to each person. Oh, yes, 13th Middlesex District. So I represent Wayland, Sudbury, Marlborough, part of Framingham. And uh, I know the, uh, the uh, senior care facility that my mother-in-law is in now has about nine deaths, which is uh, getting to be alarming. Thank you. Rep uh, Kathy Lenatra, do you want to say hello? Hi, good afternoon. I'm Rep um, Lenatra. I represent the 12th Plymouth District, which consists of Halifax, Plimpton, Kingston, part of Duxbury, part of Middleborough, and part of Plymouth. And Rep Socolo. Hi, folks. Good afternoon. I'm Michelle Socolo. I represent 15th Middlesex District, which includes Lexington and part of Woburn. And we do certainly have a lot of um, elder care facilities, nursing home facilities, and uh, over 55 housing in our district. So um, I am pleased to be looking at the bill in front of us, but also that this committee is able to pick its work up back up and continue um, driving forward an agenda. Thank you to the chairs. And Senator Feeney. Are you unmuted? I'll, I'll help out with that. Senator Paul Feeney. Got it. Now I'm unmuted. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good to be here with everybody. Looking forward to the testimony. I represent the Bristol and Norfolk District. Uh, joining you from the thriving metropolis of Foxborough, Massachusetts. So uh, good to be on with everybody. Thank you, Madam Chair uh, and Chairwoman Jalen for taking the lead uh, on this, this vital uh, and critically important issue for all of us. Appreciate it. And I don't believe I see any other committee members. Uh, am I, oh, I'm wait, who am I missing? Uh, oh, you, un, un, oh, it says Susan Kennedy. Um, that's what, conf uh, Dimitri, unmute him. That was the, go ahead. Right, I'm on a different computer, but anyways, I'm Ed Kennedy from the state senator from the first Middlesex district, which includes Lowell, Westford, Groton, Dunstable, Kingsborough, and Pepperell. Thank you. All right, I thought um, I'll just sort of lay out the rules. Again, we're trying very hard to be like a public hearing that's in the State House. Um, we did, uh, the slight adjustment was that we asked uh, everyone who wanted to testify orally to make that request uh, in advance of the hearing. And uh, a bunch of people did that and we're gonna recognize them uh, in order. Um, and I just wanted to remind people that we also welcomed written testimony and people can continue to submit that until noon tomorrow. And that's on the Google Doc on the uh, website. So um, there were two uh, legislators who signed up and as our fashion, um, we take those uh, legislators first. Um, uh, although I don't see Representative O'Day, I'm not sure that he's come, so he might join us later. And Representative Speliotis, uh, mm -hmm. are you here? I am. All right, so you've yes. unmuted him. So you're up. You're up first. Great. The uh, soon-to-be dean of the house. Right? I know. <laughs> thank, thank you, Madam Chair, and, and Senator Jalen as well as Chair. Uh, it's good to be with you this afternoon. Only. Uh, yeah. To follow up some a few of the introductory comments of your committee members, I would uh, say a little stronger that this time uh, for us uh, that have facilities in the district are really overwhelming and frightening. Uh, I've had a few incidences over the last month or so that um, no legislator would want and uh, really doesn't serve a purpose to get into but just illustrates the amount of fear, frustration, lack of understanding amongst all parties, uh, the employees, the families, the administrations of these facilities, because the ones I've been dealing with are quite large. They're parts of chains. 
and um, the information flows from the bottom up, from the top down. And if you are an individual legislator trying to find out what's going on, it's extremely difficult. Uh, I do know that there is a system in place now to require reporting. I believe it's called MAVEN, and uh, the, the facilities are supposed to report to the Commonwealth those statistics of who, who has been tested positive, who's passed away, uh, any type of public health issues. And I think that this legislation strengthens that process. However, I'm really here to say that this industry, especially those um, that have long-term care facilities, have been the forgotten area in our health care. And I'm really here to ask the committee to step forward once we're done with this, with some more comprehensive um, legislation that provides an opportunity to have some type of oversight and some type of accountability. I believe that what, what will result in the next few weeks or months is not only a piece of legislation like this, but perhaps some financial support for the one struggling area or the most struggling area in our healthcare field. But without accountability and without asking them to be responsible and let us know what those funds are being used for, I don't think we're gonna accomplish what we'd like to accomplish. So that's what brings me here today. So thank you very much for allowing me the opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your input. Um, uh, sorry, I just blocked my screen inadvertently. Uh, we're gonna uh, continue now uh, with the people who've signed up. Uh, I would indicate some people additionally have uh, submitted written testimony but didn't opt to sign up uh, for oral testimony, but I want everyone to know that the committee members have access to all the um, uh, all the written testimony that has been submitted. And in fact, they have a Google Doc, which will um, refresh right up till noon tomorrow. So anything that is in writing and is submitted to the committee uh, will be reviewed by all the members of the committee. So uh, we're continuing with this hearing on House Bill 4635, uh, which requires disclosure on the part of long-term care facilities and elder housing. Um, to the Department of Public Health. Uh, I will, and Dimitri will help me if I either miss anyone or leave people out from the list. Um, but I see Julia Cluet, I believe, from Care Dimensions uh, is next up. So if she's here, you would need to unmute her. Or if she'd raise her hand on the icon, would that help? Maybe that, would, that would help, Julia, if you are here. I'll also. You know what? I'll go. To... She's calling in. What? I'll see if there's a phone number associated. I'll call on the next person while you do that. Susan Stefan. Can you unmute Susan Stefan? Susan. Uh, unless she's not here. Not see a Susan Stefan. What? I do not see a Susan. So. All right, we will um, come back to these folks uh, in case you know there's confusion about how this thing is working. Uh, next is um, Mike Festa from AARP and uh, my former house colleague and classmate. Mike Festa, you're on. I I just wanted to make sure that uh, unmute got on there, and thank you very much. Uh, Madam Chair, let me stop by on a lighter note saying I want to thank you for giving me a chance to put on a suit and a sport coat because uh, I should say a sport coat and a tie because it's been about a month mm -hmm. and uh, out of respect for the uh, committee members and you, Madam Chair, as well as Chair Jalen, I thought I'd dress up. Um, on the matter at hand, um, I, I have to, I'm thinking about Trish and the other reps from the uh, western part of the state. These Zoom meetings I think we're on to something here. It could be a very convenient <laughs> way to uh, convey um, um, thoughts and, you know, in this case, hearings uh, and, and opinions on legislation. But suffice to say, that's a matter uh, for another day with leadership. But I do want to address on a very serious note uh, the point about your legislation. First and foremost, 
My name is Mike Festa, State Director of AARP in Massachusetts. I'm representing uh, over 775,000 members in Massachusetts alone. And uh, we, are, we are obviously an organization which is fundamentally focused on supporting people 50 plus. And for the reasons that you stated in the, uh, at the onset of this uh, hearing, uh, there's a particular concern uh, for us as an organization, for you and your committee, on what's happening in these uh, skilled nursing facilities and other elder housing uh, places. Uh, in particular, what I wanted to sort of give you a background on, and I'll be very brief because I know we're operating under the usual rules of the committee. Uh, to put context on this, on April 7th, we sent a letter to the Baker administration raising some concerns regarding the fundamental issue of transparency, understanding that for the residents and their families in particular, but just in general, uh, the information coming from these facilities vis-a-vis -vis what where the COVID-19 incidences were, uh, issues in, involving safety and protection measures that are being undertaken, uh, we raise those concerns. And, you know, there is no doubt that the administration has responded to a significant degree, uh, particularly in terms of that whole, uh, re, you know, moving people to uh, other facilities, um, you know, uh, there was a lot to that, and I understand why the administration wanted to make that effort to create uh, these say, these spaces for just COVID-19 folks. But the truth of the matter is, we are still uh, now nine days later in a place where your legislation is really critical to addressing what is, in fact, the uh, uh, incompleted task, the uncompleted task, if you will, and that is to ensure that there is full transparency regarding what is happening in these uh, facilities, uh, particularly with regard to um, what is being um, unaddressed. Um, I would make a couple of points. You know, we know that a, the very high incident, incidence of uh, COVID-19 is occurring in these facilities. And, and, and the deaths uh, are very significant uh, as a percentage of deaths overall. What we saw in this legislation, and I'm now going, I'm scrolling down using my other screen to make a point. Um, I, by, parenthetically, I've submitted written legislation. And Madam Chair, I think you were aware from a, a previous indication uh, from ARP that we think there are pieces of the uh, sections of the bill that could be amended to strengthen what we consider to be one aspect of the legislation not fully addressed, and that is uh, allowing the access that you are providing to the legislature and to the to public in that in that way to be fully public um, by requiring. Uh, and I, I won't go through all these amendments, but I would tell you that we want to number one in section B add staffing levels at the licensed and unlicensed facilities as part of the disclosure. Um, not just the, po uh, the, the, the positive cases and the mortalities. In section three, we think it's really helpful if the Department of Health would also report weekly in, uh, on their uh, website, uh, because this report at a minimum could identify each of the residences, uh, the facility or the long-term care facility by name, the associated number of COVID-19 positive cases, uh, and any reductions in staffing levels compared to staffing levels before the declaration of the state of emergency. And I think it's self-evident why that's an important consideration, because again, this speaks to the matter of the safety of the residents and the understanding of what's really happening uh, with uh, family members, loved ones uh, who are quite concerned about the circumstances. And last, I wanna say that in section D, um, we're looking for additional legislation, which again, I, I rather than read it, I would just highlight the fact that we are looking very, um, uh, very much in making sure that there are disclosures across the system of providing information to the public. And that in a way I think is going to uh, provide a, a level of confidence uh, that the public can have as well as the legislature in how not just the Department of Public Health is regulating and, 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 and dealing uh, with some of the challenges, 
but also uh, for the families and the residents to have a, a full appreciation of the conditions uh, that they are uh, dealing with. So I wanna end by saying, first and foremost, thank you, Madam Chair, for filing this legislation. Secondly, uh, we appreciate the efforts of the administration in many ways. Uh, this is a challenge. We are right in the middle, as we all know, of the worst part of this uh, pandemic, certainly in the first phase and hopefully the only phase. But with this legislation, I think there will be an appropriate focused attention on those most vulnerable folks and understanding the truth of what's happening in those facilities. So I hope the legislation passes, the AARP is strongly supportive, and we will convey this uh, to our members as well as to the general public, not just through this hearing, but through other medium. So I wanna thank you for that. And like I say, the details of the amendments we're respectfully proposing uh, are included uh, in, in my written testimony. So that's it, and thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Before I open uh, for questions from the community, I want to recognize that Representative uh, Tommy Vitolo has joined us and apparently from the House Chamber. So, oh. okay. Uh, so you'll unmute uh, Rep Vitolo. Uh, are there any questions from members of the committee uh, for uh, Mike Festa? And I think the way we would do this is okay. you could do the icon. Oh, it looks like Rep. Far oh, this works. <laughs> I'm Rep still Farley unmuted too, so that helps. Oh, Rep. Farley okay. Bouvier has some questions. Um, I guess it's more, thank you, Madam Chair. I think it's more of a, and of course I'm looking over here because on my computer, you know, you're there and Mike is down there. So um, <laughs> that's why I'm doing that. I know, Hello up there. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, I'm, I really appreciate the fact, uh, one, that this bill has been um, filed, thank you, Madam Chair, but you looking at it closely, Mike, and the idea of the staffing levels is something that we've been you know, concerned about long before this, right? We've talked about our nursing home, um, our workforce crisis within the nursing homes, and now it's only um, more of a crisis. And so to be able to report those um, regularly um, during this crisis, I think is going to be helpful to everybody to be able to keep a really close eye on that issue. So um, I really appreciate that thoughtfulness in in uh, in that idea of including this in. So that's all I have to say. Thank you, Madam Chair. Any other members of the committee? I don't see any. Uh, since you are unmuted, if I don't spot the icon, you could probably just call out. But it looks like um, I want to thank you, Mike. And the next person to testify is uh, Adrian uh, George. Is Adrian on the call? Sandy, I did my first testimony. Um, what? Do we see that name, or, Dimitri? I'm looking. Oh, I think, did she say she was going to be submitting oral testimony? I, oh. Well, she's on the list, but that's all right. Um, oh, maybe some people signed up if they were, well, okay. We'll, Representative, uh, I, the, I do just want to point out that Representative O'Day has joined us. Oh, okay. Uh, Representative O'Day, we've been looking for you. Where are you? Can you uh, unmute him? Rep O'Day, you're up. I don't see him or hear him. I have unmuted. You know what? We have so few people uh, on. I'm not so worried if you unmute everyone to make sure we catch people. And Ruth, um, Adrienne said she didn't plan to submit oral testimony. Uh, OK, thank you. There's several others like that. Oh, all right. So, oh, they, oh, maybe the way the document was people. Yeah. Filled it out. Okay. It's a uh, number G. <laughs> Oops. Yeah. Is Rep O'Day uh, here? Hello. Oh, there we go. Oh, uh, there you are. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Senator, members of the committee. Thank you. Uh, uh, Madam Chair, thank you so much for 
taking on this issue. As you know, you and I have spoken a number of times uh, in regards to this issue, and I, I am certainly uh, very supportive of it. Um, I'm wondering if we're hearing from from actual people um, in, in the industry relative to their sense on how this, how this will possibly increase their workload. Um, and I, I understand the reasoning behind this. Uh, I understand the need for this, but I'm just wondering, have we gotten much feedback from the industry itself uh, with regards to, you know, an, an you know, and that's been one of my concerns um, over the last several weeks, um, you know, members of, of my community in this industry uh, started reaching out early on <clears throat> with the concerns and the issues and the difficulties that they were running into, um, you know, primarily around, you know, PPEs and so on and so forth. And, and I'm not here today to uh, be the dead horse because we all know what the issues are. Um, but, you know, we all knew what, what, what segment of the population was going to be impacted by this disease. And, you know, I, from, from, from all indications that I have with the folks out here in Central Mass, they were not provided with the kind of instructions and guidance that they felt they needed in order to truly provide the services uh, that they were hoping to provide to their to their to their patients and that's one of the things that I'd, I'd like us to be able to address um, going forward um, with you know we, we're still in the surge and we have folks I spoke to two different nursing homes today People are struggling with coming to work. People are concerned about their safety. People are concerned about the increasing numbers of, of those individuals that are testing positive and, and, and they're being asked to do more with less. And um, so, you know, I, unfortunately, I'm probably not speaking enough about this bill as I am about the, the, the issue in, in general. And I just wanted to have the opportunity to sort of weigh in a little bit. So thank you for all of what you're doing here. Uh, but I guess my final question would be the one I started out with. Have we heard from the industry and how do they feel that this reporting is going to help them be better providers of services? And I really think that that's really the point of what we're trying to accomplish. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Representative. You've been uh, an amazing champion for aging adults, and uh, you were one of the first people who called me when this uh, crisis began, expressing your concern and uh, eager to weigh in uh, on behalf of what people need. Uh, I um, will leave the answer to that question to people as they testify. I know that we have voices and uh, that can answer that question from their own experience. Uh, are there any members of the committee who would like to um, ask question or respond to uh, Representative O'Day? And, and so now everyone's been muted again. So um, maybe you can just unmute everyone again. Uh Representatives have not been muted. Oh, they've not? No, unless yes, they, they have. Unless they've muted themselves. What? Uh, unless they've muted themselves. Oh, I see. OK, sorry. Madam Chair. Yes. Uh, Madam Chair, so before this crisis, I, I could recall visiting at least one nursing home where one would walk in and there'd be no uh, no greeting, no no staff to see that someone was walking in or walking out. I have to believe, and that was in my district. And uh, I, I imagine, you know, with, with this, with this crisis, you know, now it's every every facility is locked down so that, you know, they're not accepting visitors. Uh, so, for example, that facility would have to have changed its uh, its procedures for allowing people to enter the premises. But, you know, in the absence, I, I don't know if there was an absence of a state mandate to. Um, to regulate people coming in to facilities or, or not, if there was 
then they were in violation of it in the past. But uh, this this crisis really does highlight, you know, the need for some regulations so that people have a protocol, uh, facilities have a protocol to to reach out to in, in times like this. Are there other members of the committee who would like to question or comment at this time? Just it's my understanding that there are no visitors at assisted living or or um, nursing facilities. No visitors, except if the person is in hospice. If the person goes into hospice, this is my understanding, uh, they can have visitors. All right, thank you. If there aren't any more comments from the committee, uh, I'd like to recognize Sophie Hansen. Is she here? I know that Sophie, you know, some people I think submitted written and then it got linked to this list. Um, go over to, to the, the column G. You'll see that the next person would be Tara Gregorio. She's okay. down twice um, and also okay. for them. Those are the only okay. two. Yes. Okay. All right, Tara, do you, uh, I'm gonna read through that whole list afterwards just to make sure we don't miss anyone, but um, Tara, are you with us? I, I have received a note that Tara uh, will not be available uh, okay. here, but she has submitted a written testimony. All right, uh, I'm gonna, you won't see my face because I'm looking at the Google document for a moment, but I'm gonna just read down the whole list. Um, oh, Ar Arlene Germain. She's here. Oh, yes. Arlene, um, did here. you want to testify? Uh, yes. Uh, I'm okay. Now. okay. Yes. Great. Yes. Thank you. Well, really, thank you, because I know that you've been burning the midnight oil and got in touch with us very early on. Um, so thank you, for the committee, for all of your efforts. Um, I think you know that Manor is the only uh, consumer group that's advertising for improvements in the quality of care and quality of life of uh, Massachusetts nursing home residents. And um, we are strongly in support of HB 4635. Um, currently, there is inconsistent reporting on the positive cases and mortalities by the Massachusetts long-term care facilities. And this bill will bring much needed coordination on basic data necessary for determining staffing and other needs for slowing down the spread of the coronavirus and eventually conquering it. Um, as a matter of fact, on April 2nd, um, there was a letter from US Senators Casey and Wider um, addressed to CMS and the CDC to accomplish on a federal level what this bill is expecting to accomplish statewide. Um, the US letter explains the benefits of sharing open and coordinated data and timely information about how and where this virus is spreading is critical to the successful mitigation of the virus's spread, um, direction of resources and access to support. And HB 4635 will similarly benefit the safety, health, and well being of the Massachusetts frontline healthcare workers and residents of nursing homes, rest homes, and assisted living facilities. Um, now, we are proposing um, a few additional points to be incorporated into the legislation, and I'll just read a few. Um, <clears throat> the point that um, Mike touched made about staffing is critical. And also, um, we're recommending that D DPH shall be required to post reported data by facility daily on a publicly accessible website. Um, reports should include the death as well as transfers discharges to acute care hospitals or other care facilities. Um, require reporting on the number of residents and staff members tested for COVID-19 and the results of such testing and updated as appropriate. Um, let's see. We're also recommending including um, CCRCs 
as well as age-restricted buildings and, and the populations that are going to um, be um, um, tracked. And also um, having reports made to the Joint Committee on Public Health and to the Joint Committee on Elder Affairs. And re we're thinking that reporting to the legislature should be at least three times per week instead of weekly. And in our research, we did see that um, ACA and also um, leading age is in support of these types of um, public reporting. Um, it was in an article, let's see, that was um, in McKnight's. And I can forward that to you at some point if you'd like. And um, in closing, I just want to thank you very much you know, for all of the time and effort that you're putting into, into elders and making sure that they're safe. Thank you. Darling, thank you very much for your testimony and for all your advocacy. Uh, are there any members of the committee that would like to ask a question? Okay. I don't see any. Dimitri, we all set? Do you see? Okay, okay then. Uh, what? No. Okay, then. I also see that Walter Ramos has uh, asked to testify orally. Yes. Uh, so unmute uh, Mr. Ramos. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I think we can Thank hear you. you. Very much, uh, Senator Jalen and uh, Representative Walter and members of the committee. Uh, I appreciate and thank you for this opportunity uh, to testify before you this afternoon. I come before you in my capacity as president and CEO of Rogers and Communities. And I feel it's important to tell you about Rogers and Communities and what we do so you can understand the impact of what uh, this legislation will have on us and our staffing. Rogers and Communities operates three Boston-based adult day health programs that provide supportive health services for over 300 older adults annually from Boston's diverse neighborhoods. We also manage 1,401 units of assisted and independent living in 22 properties. All of these efforts directly support Rogerson's mission. We are a nonprofit. Uh, we bring uh, dignity, self-reliance, and vitality to the lives of elders and low-income men and women maximizing their health and wellness and allowing them to age at home and in their community uh, and working cooperatively with neighbors and organizations to create housing, health and supportive services. At Rogerson, we have a very proud legacy of maintaining the highest standards in our managed units. We strictly comply with requirements mandated by funding agencies and we always respond very promptly to emergency and other resident needs. As you know, we have been on the front lines of this pandemic. The staff at Rogerson, which I have the distinct honor to work with, are here because they have a dedication to the people we serve. We can't compete in salaries with large academic hospitals. Our staff do what they do out of dedication, a calling and a real love of our residents. They are, in many instances, our residents' families. Our staff do what they do out of dedication. COVID-19 has placed an incredible demand on our frontline staff who return day after day to meet our residents' needs. As the first administrator of the Boston Public Health Commission that I served at for many years, I served on the front lines of prevention and reporting. As the former president of Kearney Hospital, I know the fear that our vulnerable residents have of and needing hospitalization. And now that I'm here at Rogerson, I'm seeing it from a different side. We remain committed to fulfilling our mission during this time of crisis. Our response to this in, in, uh, coronavirus pandemic has impacted our delivery of service across Rogerson's portfolio. Our staff are diligently working to implement protocols uh, in early March, we began at our adult day health pro, uh, program sites. And these are just some of the steps that we took. We restricted access to the ADH program uh, to staff and participants only. We assessed employees and participants for flu and coronavirus symptoms before they entered the van or the ADH program. 
and sent participants home for follow-up care if they displayed concerning symptoms. We did daily sanitizing of all touch points in our ADH program, such as doorknobs, handrails, soap dispensers, chairs, doors, elevator buttons, everything. Uh, we provided hand sanitizer at all stations in all major areas of our day programs. We posted signage at all programs uh, you know, for the symptoms uh, to be aware of coronavirus and declare protocols for staff and participants to stay at home if they were ill or symptomatic. We postponed all of our outings and activities, which are important to our residents, especially when it comes to socialization. Additionally, all of our employees and our participants were provided with health and safety servicing, hand washing and universal precautions, uh, coronavirus system precautions, prevention measures. We also increased our training and our retraining efforts. In our housing and assisted uh, living and independent living, we had a different set of protocols, setting very strict visitor policies and procedures posted at all of our entrances and in common areas at our residential sites screening visitors and vendors for any symptoms, which may include the taking of temperatures and long-term care sites and adult day health programs. Again, we require the use of hand sanitizers. We restricted any activities that involved crowds or sharing foods or drinks. We closed our dining rooms to non-residents at long-term care sites. Uh, we did continuing training on proper hand washing and preventative measures. Uh, we restricted transportation activities we enforced all the protocols our residents, uh, for our residents to practice social distancing and avoid public, placing, public places and gatherings. But as you might imagine, when you have so many of our residents who have dementia and Alzheimer's, and part of that disease means they wander. Uh, and being able to keep them distancing is a major effort of our staff uh, because they may not understand what you've told them, or they may have forgotten what you've told them which makes taking care of dementia and Alzheimer patients in this pandemic a very challenging uh, activity to keep our, our residents safe and to keep our staff uh, engaged in keeping them from violating the social, the social distancing. At Rogerson House, where our residents have memory loss, dementia and Alzheimer's on March 10th, give you the scenario, on March 10th, we began screening all visitors and visits were restricted to members of the immediate family. On March 14th, 14th, we went to a strict no visitor policy uh, that was put in place. No family, uh, non-essential care providers could enter the building. We exceeded the recommendations of the Boston Public Health Commission that all residents are currently ass assessed multiple times for fever and symptoms. In addition, staff were again assisted with hand sanitizer for residents who frequently wandered in their neighborhood we call the different floors neighborhoods. Uh, staff also had their temperature taken upon arrival and again during their shift. And all direct staff care workers were using full PPE. We did deep cleaning and sanitizing, which is ongoing at the Rogerson House. Uh, we clean and disinfect. Uh, and we have uh, designated one floor to quarantine any resident who might exhibit uh, symptoms of coronavirus who are who was tested and is waiting for test results. The adult day health program at Rogerson House was closed on March 17th until the pandemic is over. Staff are helping, as I mentioned, the residents practice social distancing. Residents are taking their meals in their own rooms. For those who require more supervision or help, um, you know, we, we provide the meals in the dining room, but we practice social distancing. Uh, programmed activities, uh, you know, are, are done in the rooms, especially for those who have dementia. Uh, families can no longer visit their loved ones, and the staff facilitates this by virtual visits through FaceTime, Skype, and between residents and their families. Uh, staff is also posting on Instagram and Facebook for families to see their loved ones uh, during the day at Rogers. Families receive email updates regularly from us and are in constant communication via email and phone with the executive directors. Rogerson has and will continue to report immediately to DPH and the Boston Public Health Commission for any resident who tests positive for COVID-19. This week, we, we called in the National Guard 
to conduct testing of all staff and residents at Rogerson House and Spring House. The guide had already been at Rogerson House this past Saturday to do an initial testing of 13 residents. And I'm pleased to report as of Tuesday that we had only, and I use the word only cautiously because one is too many, three positive residents. To date, we have been successful as we possibly can in containing the virus and protecting the people we really care for with dedication and love. I am concerned with the requirements of HB 4635 that we will have difficulty in meeting without access to adequate testing capabilities in an assisted living facility. I do know you know all too well the challenges of getting tested. We called in the national testing, the national guide to get testing done. As the wealthiest and most powerful nation in the world, this is unacceptable. I cannot provide mandating testing, mandated testing results if I have no ability to test across the board. In our independent living facilities, our residents live independently and they come and go in their units as they please and then some of them travel. We are not permitted in their apartments to clean or inspect or disinfect in any way. They live independently like you and I do. I don't know how I can be reported to mandate what I don't know then. Rest assured, I wholeheartedly believe in reporting and I have done it. In fact, as I mentioned, I was the first administrator of the agency that required it. I know its value and I support the need for reporting, but how can I be mandated if of independent residents who I have no legal authority to test? How can I be mandated to report in an assisted living facility where I have a different level of care than independent living, but I, I have no test to implement testing? With a virus that can be asymptomatic, how can I hold my dedicated workforce to mandate reporting of something they cannot see? So I respectfully ask the committee to help us get testing capability for assisted living residents. And I will do as I always have, report everything forced with, forthwith to the rightful oversight agencies who are protecting our citizens, our citizens uh, especially our vulnerable elder citizens. But I can't do that without the tools necessary. So I want to thank you for this opportunity to testify before you today. And I wish all of you Godspeed, as this is a difficult time for all of us, and I know for you as well. Thank you very much for your testimony, and thank you for all that you're doing. Um, are there members of the committee who have uh, questions? I just want to add my thanks and for your detailed description of what you all are doing and what so many other uh, facilities are doing. And thank you for taking the time to be with us today and for expressing some of the concerns you have. Thank you. Uh, let me just add um, that we as a committee have been advocating strenuously uh for more testing for more ppe and for more staff we understand that that's what's needed uh it is our my hope that the more transparent we are the more reporting that's done the more we can you know move the resources uh where they need to be i would just like a small point of clarification the bill calls for the reporting of known cases but uh, having said, so no one's responsible to report something they don't know, but I take the bigger point, which is that we should be knowing. Um, what was in, one of the things about the bill is we did not restrict the bill just to nursing homes. It's nursing homes and assisted living and all elder housing, uh, recognizing that, you know, aging adults in the range of, um, you know, residences and that the newest uh, guidance from the executive office just a day or two ago is to uh, really step up the testing at all nursing facilities and assisted living. Um, having said that, uh, I 100% take your bigger point, which is we've really got to get the testing, the staff, the PPE to all of these facilities. And I thank you thank for your you. testimony. Thank you. Does um, 
I want to make sure Senator Jalen was right. She caught that the problem on my screen is I couldn't see the entire Google Excel sheet or whatever I was looking at. So I couldn't tell the difference between the people who had signed up for writing or oral because that was like in a column further down. So, um, Dimitri, if you would just unmute everyone for if they're not already, I would just like to ask, is there, is there, an, or is there anyone who had had intended to testify orally who has not been recognized yet. What was that? Did, some, did someone respond? The best thing is to do the raise hand icon and we can flip through. But it looks like uh, I'm not hearing from anyone that there is. So I think that we can then uh, wrap up the hearing. I would remind people that the written testimony continues to be welcome uh, until noon tomorrow. All members of the committee have access so that they can, um, can review all of that material. It will be refreshed. And so if people do submit additional material, you will see that. And I would also ask the committee to watch for your emails because uh, after we've received testimony, we'll be reaching out to the committee. Uh, Senator Jalen, did you want to say anything in, as we close? Well, I do appreciate the testimony today, written and oral, but I wanted to add one thing about staffing, which is that the administration launched a portal, which you should all share with your constituents however you can, which allows people to either volunteer or be hired for the nursing facilities. Um, because of this tremendous lack of staff, it's really important that we get people signed up there. And I know uh, some people have already been hired and have started volunteering. Uh, it, it, we will not make it to as many as we need, but it will help. Well, I thank everyone um, for attending today. Uh, I think I think we did pretty well with the transition to a virtual reality. Uh, and uh, so I will uh, close the meeting and just tell everyone to stay safe, stay healthy, and keep doing the good work you're doing. Thank, thank you. you.